Hello and welcome to Maritime Medicine. This is Jonathan Busco and today we'll be discussing common rashes and other skin disorders that you'll have to deal with. By the end of the session you'll be able to identify the layers of the skin and the structures of the skin and identify four concerning findings in patients with skin rashes. You'll also be able to identify and list the treatment of common causes of rashes. So this is your skin. It's divided into three layers, the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutis or hypodermis. The epidermis is the superficial most layer. There's some nerve endings in there. You've got your pores and your hair sticking out of that, but it's really a very superficial area that's constantly growing in again from the stratum corneum. You've got your pigmentation there, and that's constantly flaking off. Underneath that, you have the real working structures. You've got your dermis, and in your dermis, you've got your hair follicles and the muscles, the erector pili muscles that make the hair stand up. You've got sebaceous glands which squirt out oils to keep the skin properly moistened and pliable. You've got nerve endings and nerve fibers and you have quite a bit of blood flow, nerves, uh, arteries and veins. And then deeper you've got your subcutis or hypodermis which is a fat layer your, which includes your larger vessels and your sweat glands are also in the dermis. So what's a rash? Well it's an abnormal skin change and they can be acute or chronic and we'll talk about acute ones here because that's what patients are going to come to you with and they can be symptomatic or asymptomatic but typically people aren't going to notice asymptomatic ones so they're not going to come to you. Unless the rash is so extensive that it's like a burn and has destroyed so much skin that you can't control your temperature and your risk for infection very rarely are rashes in and of themselves life-threatening, but they can be signs of systemic illness and they can be even be signs of life-threatening disease. So think about the patient with hives. They're stung by a bee, they develop hives. They may not have any other symptoms, but you need to be worried because you know that that's a sign of a systemic response, a full body response to the bee sting. And then they start to develop shortness of breath, they get low blood pressure, they go into shock, and potentially die. So that rash, while it isn't in and of itself life-threatening, is a sign of underlying life-threatening disease. When you see a patient with a rash, you need to obtain a rash history. And it starts with, do you have any other symptoms? The systemic symptoms, fevers, chills, weight loss, loss of appetite, change of bowel habits, chest pain, shortness of breath, night sweats, anything else going on with this because that will help to point you into the decision of whether or not this is simply just a rash with local involvement or if this is a sign of something more significant. When did it start? Under one, what circumstances and how long ago? Can you think of anything that occurred at the beginning of this? What makes it worse? A patient who tells you I have a lot of itching, it's worse at night and better during the day makes you think about scabies. What makes it better? If they tell you on days when I wash my hands at the end of my shift, I don't get nearly as much rashes on days when I forget, well, that's good to know. If it's uncomfortable, what's the quality of the discomfort? Is it itching? Is it painful? Is it sharp? Is it an aching pain? Does the pain go anywhere where the rash isn't? And how bad is the pain? And is it there all the time? Does it come and go? Does it wax and wane? Exactly what's going on with it in terms of the timing of the discomfort? What did it look like when it first showed up? Does it look the same now or has it changed? People will often do things like scratch very itchy areas to the point where you can't tell what the underlying lesion is. And you also want to know where did it start? Is it still there? Has it moved to other places? Has it gotten smaller? Those are all important historical pieces. Do you know anyone else who's also been affected, who has similar symptoms? Anyone you've been in contact with? That would suggest something more contagious, lice, scabies and any recent lifestyle changes. Oftentimes when people have a dermatitis, inflammation of the skin, there's some provoking factor. And we may not be able to figure it out, but we certainly look and we think about all these things as possible influences that could cause rash. Once you've done your rash history, you want to get a comprehensive medical history to see if they have any other underlying medical illnesses that you need to worry about, and a comprehensive review of systems to make sure you're not missing any associated symptoms. When you examine them, you want to know where the rash is and what it looks like. So is it in their core, over their chest, abdomen, and back? That would be central. Or is it on their extremities? That would be peripheral. That would include the face and, and the head. 
although you can note those separately because there's some rashes that only appear there. Is it on the surfaces of the skin that flex, like the inside of the wrist, or that extend, the outside of the elbow? Is it in skin folds, the inner triginal spaces where skin is contacting on skin and it's warm and moist? Is it between the digits, between the fingers? Is it in the dermatomes? Well, it's a dermatome. A dermatome is where one of your skin nerves go, and they are stacked one on top of each other in your skin. And the little narrow area that each of those skin nerves gets its sensation from is called a dermatome. So is it in one dermatome, or is it just patchy and blotchy and all over the place? Is there neurotic excoriation? That is, is there only a rash or scratching where the patient can reach, and is everywhere else fine? And are the mucous membranes involved? Because that gives you different ideas about what might be going on. And then in terms of the appearance, is it scaly, covered with little flakes? Is it moist or dry? What color is it? Is it pigmented, like a freckle, or does it look like their underlying base skin color? Does it look like honeycomb crusting across the top of it? Is it a firm raised mass with a little hole in the center, what's called umbilicating? Does it blanch? That is, if you have a red lesion and you push it, does it turn pale? And when you let go of it, does it turn red again? Can you feel it, or is it flat? So the bullseye-looking rash right in the center on the top is erythematous. It's red, and that's important to be able to describe to medical control. To be able to say it's bullseye is also very helpful. Maculopapular, if you look in the lower left of the screen, a macule is a flat area involving the superficial most layers of the skin typically. A papule is a raised area, and if you get many papules together, it's called a plaque. Are there petechiae or purpura? If you look at that leg on the right, you see that dark red. And there's larger areas, those are purpura, and smaller pinpricks, those are petechiae. And those tell you that the underlying blood vessels are leaking. So if you pushed on those, they wouldn't blanch because that's essentially like a bruise. It's just a localized area of bleeding. And is it vesicular or a bulla? So you can see those little fluid collections or vesicles, a larger one there is the bulla, and that involves all the layers of the skin. So you've now done a pretty good history and exam, and you need to know if you need to be worried. Well, these are things that should get you very worried. If the patient has a fever or abnormal vital signs, if they're having chest pain or shortness of breath, if there's hemorrhage all over the body in multiple spots, or you're seeing petechiae or purpura, those can be signs of benign disease, like a, a local vasculitis. They can also be signs of meningitis. Anyone with a rash and altered mental status, you need to be very concerned, particularly if there's any history of headache associated with that. And if the mucous membranes are involved, that's concerning as well. That suggests more systemic disease, typically. So if you see any of these red flags, get in touch with medical control. All right, now we're going to talk about some common complaints you're going to have to deal with. One of the most common is cellulitis, which is bacterial infection of the skin. Our skin's a pretty good barrier at keeping bacteria out. But if you get a wound, like that abrasion you can see on the ulnar side of the hand in that top picture, it opens up the skin and the bacteria can get in. And in that picture, you see the redness right around the abrasion, and then you see streaky redness going up the arm along the lymph vessels where the infection is spreading up through the lymphatics. In the lower picture, you're seeing a red swollen leg. You can see ink lines that were drawn to show where the edges of the infection were. And probably the one on the ankle and the upper one were drawn first. And then uh, to contain the redness over the calf, showed where the edges were. And then it extended down to the foot. So what are your typical findings in cellulitis? Dolor, calor, ruber, and tumor. Well, what the heck are those? Dolor is pain and tenderness. Calor is heat. Ruber is redness and tumor is swelling. So cellulitic skin is tender, hot, red, and swollen. And depending on how extensive it is, the patient may have a fever. So your treatment, antibiotics, oral, possibly IV, possibly IM. And you'll want to talk to medical control about potentially evacuating these patients if they're really sick or if they have multiple risk factors like diabetes or peripheral vascular disease. A lot of people will have itchy red rashes, and those are typically from coming in contact with something, either 
a chemical irritation of the skin, a contact dermatitis, or an allergic irritation, uh, atopic dermatitis. And so on your exam, the dermatitis is inflammation of the skin. So you'll see some diffuse redness. You may see some small blisters and a severe itch. So if you look at the upper picture, there was a small wound, there was a Band-Aid put over it, and the adhesive from the Band-Aid caused the redness around there. That's a contact dermatitis or chemical dermatitis. On the picture that's down below, that's exposure to poison ivy. And so where the Roos toxin contacted the skin, you get these large blisters, fluid-filled blisters, and they're very, very itchy. So how do you treat these? Well, eliminate the cause if you can. You can give them diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl for the itch. And depending on where it is, you may need oral or topical steroids. Topical steroids, no more than seven days. Don't use them on the face if, unless you talk to medical control specifically about that. For someone with poison ivy that's extensive and you're going to use oral steroids for, you need to keep them on it for 14 days or they'll get rebound when they finish their seven-day course. About day eight or nine, it all comes back with a vengeance and then they hate you. So you don't want to do that. People will get bumpy, hairy, painful pus pockets, folliculitis, which is irritation and infection at the hair roots, uh, often caused from shaving, so traumatic causes. So you'll get red spots, which are centered around the hairs. You can see some of those on this mustache and also some areas of pus. Your treatment is to stop the irritation. If you've got a large surrounding area of cellulitis, the, uh, the red, hot, tender, swollen area, then you may need antibiotics, and if they have an abscess, you might possibly need antibiotics. So carbuncles and furuncles or abscesses, you get a collection of pus in the skin. Basically, the body walls off the infection. The pus is all the white blood cells coming to fight the infection. You get a painful red fluctuant lump that you can feel. It's often at the base of a root hair. And your treatment is hot packs, incision and drainage, and if they have a cellulitis with it or it's bigger than five centimeters, think about oral antibiotics. But oral antibiotics alone won't fix these because the, the infection is inside of the abscess and the antibiotics can't get to it. And once you've drained the abscess, you've let the infection out. So oftentimes, unless there's also a cellulitis around it, antibiotics don't change what happens at all. Fungal skin infections are very caused, so you get a local fungal skin infection. You can get tinea pedis, which is athlete's foot. You see that up on the top. Tinea cruris, or jock itch. Cruris means cross. You see that in the middle, in that contact area, that intertriginal fold, there's an infection. Tinea corporis, or ringworm. You can see that on the bottom. And tinea capitis, we usually see that in kids, but adults can get it. We get fungal infection over the scalp. So you get this itchy raised red rash, it's got this white scale on it, and the treatment is a topical antifungal, and if it's really itchy, you can think about diphenhydramine to help with the itch. So pediculosis, this is lice, and you can get lice on the head, in the body hair, and in the pubic hair. In the pubic hair, it's known as crabs, and it's considered to be usually a sexually transmitted disease, Really, lice anywhere is person-to-person -person transmitted. And so on your exam, you're going to find a patient who's scratching a lot, who has small bite marks on their body, and sometimes visible lice, and that's a louse you see just below there, or egg cases, the nits, particularly uh, in the longer hair. So the treatment is permethrin 1% lotion. For head or pubic lice, you shampoo the hair, towel it dry and then saturate that area, wash it off in 10 minutes, repeat the treatment again in 10 days, and comb out any egg cases with a fine tooth comb. On the body, you apply it to the affected area, 10 minutes later, wash it off, and you repeat that treatment in 10 days. And that should take care of it. Now, of course, the lice live all over the bedding and clothing and hats, so that all needs to be hot washed or dry cleaned and any contacts who could have lice and you know if you think about in schools lice just spread from kid to kid to kid uh, in the elementary schools and in families it, it really can spread to other contacts so you need to treat all contacts to make sure that the uh, lice is not becoming epidemic shipboard 
Scabies can also become epidemics shipboard, and it's caused by uh, the uh, itch mite, so little mite bites, and they actually burrow under the skin. So on your exam, you find a patient who complains of severe itching, particularly in the folds of the skin, navel, the groin, the hands, uh, classically between the fingers in the web spaces is where you'll often see this start. Very, very uncomfortable. And you may see little burrows, which look like little lines, and you'll see tiny specks in, it, in them. And that's actually the mite poop. And that's a big part of what makes it so itchy. That stuff is incredibly irritating. Sometimes you'll find normal skin. You know, you look at this picture of this patient's arm, you see these patches. And a lot of that's from the irritation, from the mite droppings, and from scratching. And if you've got multiple affected crew, then you know that this is what you're dealing with, especially if you have several crew members with normal skin exam complaining of severe itching. And this can be, uh, this can be a problem, not just from person to person contact, but even hot bunking and other techniques where people are, are sharing common bedding and space. So the treatment is permethrin. You're going to have 1% available. The general recommendation is 5%, but 1% will work, and you put it on the entire body below the neck. Um, generally, these don't seem to bother the head for some reason. Leave it on for 12 hours, then rinse it off in a shower. Repeat that in one week, and all the bedding, all the clothes, everything that could be inf infested by the mites needs to be hot washed um, or disposed of. There are plenty of other things that cause rashes. There's lots of other rashes. So if you're examining a patient and they have a rash and it's not clear what's going on, make sure that you can describe the rash and then contact medical control. Thank you for your attention. Please complete any associated knowledge reviews. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact your professor or instructor.